Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the next session on Pharmaceutical Organic Chemistry, Paper 3. In the Unit 2, we are studying about Stereoisomerism, Part 2. In Lecture 4, we will be studying about Atropisomerism and Stereochemical Reactions. I am Dr. Balaji, currently working as Associate Professor in the School of Biotechnology at Jawaharlal Nehru University. This project is sponsored by DTH Swayam Prabha, MHRD, New Delhi. The topics that will be covered in this session includes atropisomerism, the definition of atropisomerism, assigning configuration to various atropisomers and examples of atropisomerism both in the drug development and in other cases. It will be followed by studies about stereochemical reactions, basically what are stereoselective reactions, what are stereospecific reactions and examples of stereoselective and stereospecific reactions. Let us study about atropisomerism. In the previous session, in the conformational analysis, we have seen uh, three major categories. One is the atropisomerism, open chain and uh, cyclic systems for conformational isomers. So, in the previous session, we have studied about the open chain butane and the ethane molecules. And the cyclic system cyclohexane also we have studied about the conformational analysis. In this particular session, we will be studying about atropisomerism. So, what is atropisomerism? The Greek word trop means turn, that is rotate, and adding a means not. Like in uh, many languages, if you are happy and you want to make the opposite of the meaning, you just add the word un. So it becomes unhappy. So the same way adding one or two letters before the word makes the opposite meaning. So in this particular case, the trop which is having a meaning turn by adding a means it is not. That means there is no turn. That is what is the meaning. And you already know the Greek word isos means equal and meros means part. So isomerism you are already aware they will be having the same molecular formula but a different arrangements. So that is what is the stereoisomerism we are actually studying now. So if we put all these words together a trope isomerism that means these compounds are basically formed by the limitation of turning that is rotation. That means the bond rotation is restricted in this kind of isomers. So we already know what are conformational isomers. Conformational isomers are generally formed by the bond rotation. So in this particular case there is a limitation that is the restriction of the bond rotation. So that is why this atropisomerism uh, is a conformational isomerism with a special class. Due to the restricted rotation, these compounds have axial symmetry and uh, we already know they belong to the conformational isomers. Let us look at some of the examples of isom atropisomerism. So this is basically the subclass of conformation, conformational isomers which can be isolated by some methods as separate chemical species that means separate individual compounds. In the case of normal conformational isomers say for example you take ethane, butane or cyclohexane many of the conformational isomers cannot be isolated due to rapid interconversion but in the case of atropisomerism 
due to the restricted rotation of the single bond, these isomers can be isolated as individual species. So that is the difference between normal conformational isomers and atrope isomers. So these are arising because of the restricted rotation about a single bond. And some examples are given here. And this is again a geometric isomerism and this is also called as a atrope isomerism. So here we have the 1,3-dibromo-2,2,6-diphenylphenylbenzene. The compound is given here. There is This is basically a biphenyl unit having 1, 2, 3, 4. Four substituents are there in the biphenyl unit. The presence of this ortho substituent is crucial for this kind of atropoisomerism. Of course, in some cases, we also have meta substituents. We will see that uh, how they are formed. In this particular case, we will be mainly looking at the ortho disubstituted biphenyls. So this biphenyl, we already know aromatic ring is a planar molecule and biphenyl is no exception. So in the unsubstituted biphenyl also, that is a planar molecule. The moment we introduce ortho substitution into the phenyl ring, we actually introduce some steric constraint also. Due to that, the free rotation about the carbon-carbon single bond is reduced. Let us look at uh, this molecule. Here we have represented this molecule in a two-dimensional way. We will go to the three-dimensional representation to understand what is the actual atrope isomers. Let us take the first example. This is uh, carbon. For simplicity, I have removed all the hydrogens in these two representations. Otherwise, all these carbons will be having hydrogens. So this is the carbon that is a methyl group. Here again, we have a methyl group. And this is the bromine atom. So in the normal unsubstituted diphenyl unit, this is the biphenyl unit having two ortho substituents. Bulky bromine is there in this particular molecule. And when you look at this molecule, this is a planar ring, but the other ring is not in plane. This is out of plane. So if you rotate the molecule little bit, little bit, you will see how the molecule is basically out of plane. So this is close to something like a perpendicular one. So how this happens simply because we have ortho substituents on this carbon, this phenyl ring, two carbon unit that is the methyl units are there and in the other ring we have a bulky bromine atom. So due to the ortho substitutions these molecules are not in plane that is they are not planar molecule anymore and there is a restriction of this CC bond rotation. So if we rotate the molecule basically this carbon carbon bond although it is a single bond is having the restricted rotation. Due to that restricted rotation we are actually seeing the molecule in a different conformational isolable isomer. Now we will see if the ortho substituents are removed, then what actually happens to this molecule? So let me remove the ortho substituents. I will pause the video and I will optimize the structure's geometry. So after optimization, we see this molecule now become planar because we have removed the ortho substitutions on this both the phenyl rings. After we remove the ortho substitution, the molecule now becomes completely planar. So this cannot be isolated. There is no conformational isomers which we can isolate for this particular molecule. But for the previous one, when there were ortho substituents, that molecule had a restricted rotation due to which we could isolate them as individual isomers. So that is what is called the atrope isomers. So this is the other isomer. 
if you look here because of the orthoceps t1 these two rings are out of plane so this way we can say the atrop isomers are isolable conformational isomers these are formed due to restricted rotation of a c c single bond in this particular case so we have seen the three dimensional representation for this molecule and we also have seen how the out of plane arrangement for this particular biphenyl unit because of the presence of ortho substituents let us look at the characteristics of atrop isomerism atrop isomers are basically stereo isomers these are subset of conformational isomers and they have hindered rotation about a single bond due to steric strain or other contributors there is a barrier to rotation because in the previous case what we have seen is there is a bulky bromine and there is ortho substitution in the other uh, aromatic ring there is a methyl group so because of the bulky bromine and the methyl group there is a steric hindrance and due to which there is a barrier to free rotation about the biphenyl connecting bond so in this particular case if the energy difference between the conformers are very high we can actually isolate the individual conformers so in other words atrop isomers are isolable conformational isomers let us look at uh, the rules for assigning configuration to this atrop isomers first we have to draw the substituents in a newman projections along the axis of hindered rotation then the ortho and in some cases the meta substituents are first assigned a priority based on con and gold prayag prolog priority rule so this cip rule we are already familiar with uh, based on the atomic number they get the highest priority and isotopes will get the priority so all those cip rules you are already familiar with so the same rule we have to apply here for assigning the priority there are two arrangements possible that is one ring vertical and other one horizontal or one ring horizontal other ring vertical so these are all the two ways we can arrange the uh, the entire molecule now starting with the substituents on the highest priority in the near ring so this is what is the most important thing you have to remember the highest priority in the near ring and moving along the shortest path to the substituents of highest priority in the far away ring so there are two rings we have said one is a vertical and the horizontal between the two one will be close to you one will be away from you so the nearest ring is the one having the highest priority to the second or the further ring where the highest priority groups these two groups whether they are in the clockwise direction or the anti clockwise direction we can assign the absolute configuration so if p or plus is assigned if the highest priority to the second highest uh, second group second rings highest priority is in the clockwise direction and m is assigned if they are in the counter clockwise direction so the one thing easy to remember is the national highway if you can remember nh then it becomes easy for you to assign the configuration for plus or minus or r and s for the atrop isomers so the near ring gets the highest priority so this is the only thing you have to remember the nearest ring highest priority group based on that we are going to assign the configuration for the rest of the molecule so remember nh national highway for near ring highest priority so this is the biphenyl system here for which we are going to assign the configuration so there are different substituents a b on one ring a prime b prime on the other ring
we are now looking from this side that means the nearest ring is the blue one in this particular case so the a is at the top and b is at the bottom and uh, the priority is a group gets the highest priority and b group gets the second priority so this is how it is actually represented and when we are looking from this side this is at the top this is at the bottom then the second ring which is far away ring so this particular a prime group is on the left hand side the b is pointing towards us that means it is on the right hand side so in this group also this is the highest priority this is the second highest priority so we put a prime and b prime so this is how the arrangement of the groups are present this is a newman projection here we have made this as a bold one because remember the nh1 so the near ring gets the highest priority so that is the reason we put this in the bold one the far away ring is written in the thin letters so that we know which is the nearest one which is the far away one now the highest priority is at the top and in the far away ring the highest priority is on the left so we have to move from 1 to 3. If we are looking from the other side, that is we are looking from this particular side. So here the pink ring is the highest priority one. So that is the reason we have put this as a bold one. That is A prime and the B prime. A prime is having the highest priority. Then the blue ring is away from us so when we are looking from this side this a prime is on our right the b prime is on our left if we are looking from this side so that is how we have actually written here and the a is at the top b is at the bottom so this gets the next priority three number four so how these groups are actually present one two three whether it is in the clockwise direction or in the anti-clockwise direction so this is what is called the M isomer because this is minus because in this particular case if it is clockwise then we say P or the plus isomer. In this particular case the highest priority one in the front ring and the highest priority group in the far away ring. If we go from this 1 to 3 this is in the counter clockwise direction. So this is what is called the M ring or the M assignment and RA is uh, you already know the CAP rule according to the CAP rule we have to keep the least priority group far away from us so in this particular case actually this is far away from us so the arrangement if you look at one highest priority second highest priority third highest uh, the next priority so these are in the one two three clockwise direction so this is actually given the r configuration so you can use either minus or we here we put a subscript a the subscript a require represents axial arrangement that means this is not the normal R and S configuration we are generally discussing about this is a axial one so that is the reason we use the word A here so RA means it is R axial isomer so the priority wise 1 2 3 in the clockwise 4 is away from us so this is the normal way of assigning the R configuration to this particular molecule and if you look at from the other side because it doesn't matter whether you look from this side or this side the configuration does not change because the molecule did not change we are only looking from different angle so looking from different angle cannot change the configuration because if a configuration has to change we already know a bond has to be broken and rejoined so that is not happening in this particular case we are only shifting our viewing angle from one side to another side so changing the viewing viewing angle does not change the configuration that we are confirming through this way in this particular case if we are looking from this side the highest priority group is given in this bold one and the least priority group 4 is far away from the observer 
So we can directly assign the configuration based on whether it is R or S. A prime is 1, B prime is 2, A is 3. So 1, 2, 3, this is in the clockwise direction. So since it is in the clockwise direction, this is again a R A isomer. Now, we are actually interchanging A prime and B prime in this particular case. Now, we are again going to assign the configuration whether it is R or S. So, in this particular case, A, we are looking from this side. So, this is the highest priority group. This is the second priority group. So, A and B, we can assign in the bold one. And in the case of A prime and B prime, so the A prime is on our right, B prime is on our left. So if we go from the other case here, we are the highest priority is at the top one. So this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. So one, two, three in the clockwise direction. So this is the P isomer that is plus isomer. So 1, 2, 3 is in the clockwise direction. So this is the P1. And uh, if you look at uh, R and S assignment, these groups, the fourth one, which is the least priority, is actually far away from us. So 1, 2, 3, this is in the counterclockwise direction. So this is a S A isomer that is axial S isomer. So for this one, if we start assigning, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, and this is 4. So the nearest one, A prime, gets the highest priority because when we are looking from this one, this is on our left hand side. So this is written on the left hand side. This B prime is on our right hand side. And A and B are top and bottom. So the priority is 3 and 4. So in this particular case, if we go from 1 to 3, because this is the near ring and this is the far away ring. So the highest priority groups, if you go from 1 to 3, this is actually in the clockwise direction. So this is actually the plus isomer or a P isomer. And if we have to give a the yes RS configuration, so the highest priority is 1, 2, and 3. This goes in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the S A isomer. So that way we can assign R and S configuration to this particular biphenyl system. And this is basically nothing but the atrope isomers. So we can use either the M or R isomers, P or S. So these are all the different notations which can be used to explain the actual configuration of this particular atrope isomers. We have another example which is a binol which is a chiral catalyst a ligand used in many of the asymmetric reaction. So let us look at how to assign configuration to this particular isomer. So we are actually looking from this side from the bottom side. So now this is the nearest ring so this is written in the bold one so the phenyl ring this is this part is written on the left the hydroxyl part is on the right so that way we can represent this one and in this molecule this phenyl ring this part is actually pointing upwards so this is written at the top and the oh is away from the observer so oh is written at the bottom so for this compound, if we have to assign the priority, the oxygen is having the highest priority compared to the phenyl ring, which is the carbon. So this gets the highest priority number one, followed by the phenyl ring gets a priority number two, because this is the near ring. So remember all the time, we have to first look at the near ring and give the priority to the near ring substituents. Then we move to the far away ring. So in the far away ring, the OH is having the next priority. So this is given number three. And the phenyl ring is pretty far, uh, the carbon is the least one. So this is given the number four. So in this particular case, if we have to say whether it is a R 
A or SA isomer or plus or minus. Now we have to look at two things. One is we can assign the R and S based on how the groups are arranged. The 4 is actually far away from us. So the groups 1, 2, 3. This is in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. You can actually understand. If it is this way, this is clockwise. If it is this way, this is the counterclockwise. So 1, 2, 3 is basically the reverse one. So that is the SA isomer. So that way we can assign the configuration for this molecule as SA. Since the OH and the, this OH they are in the clockwise direction, we can also assign this as a P isomer. So you can either use SA configuration or P configuration for this particular molecule. Now, if you are looking from this side, that is from the blue ring as the nearest one, when you are looking from the blue ring as the nearest one, this way if you are looking, so this blue ring is actually written in the bold one. So the phenyl ring actually here, this part is pointing upwards. So this is written at the top and the OH is pointing away. So it is written at the bottom. And if you are looking at uh, from the top, this OH is actually going to your right side and the phenyl ring is on your right. Uh, this is to the left hand side and this is to the right hand side. So that way we can arrange this molecule. And if we assign the numbers, priority numbers, hydroxyl gets the priority number 1 in the blue ring. So number 1, phenyl ring 2 and the hydroxyl on the far away ring gets 3 and this is 4. So if you look from 1 to 4, 4 is actually away from that, our uh, vision. So we can easily assign the RS configuration simply by looking at the priority groups. 1, 2, 3, this is in the counterclockwise direction. So again, this is SA. So it doesn't matter whether you look from the bottom or from the top. It is both one and the same. We are still having the same configuration only. So SA is the same thing. So irrespective of whichever way is convenient to you, you can actually look at the molecule. It is not necessary that you have to look from either top or bottom or from right hand side or left hand side. So there is no priority. The only thing what you have to look at is the atoms or groups, atomic number based on that assign the priority. And in this particular case, if you look at the P isomer, so the hydroxyl is uh, the blue one is on the highest priority one, so it is one. And in the second far away ring, the hydroxyl is in the left hand side. So if you go from the one to three in the second ring, this is in the clockwise direction. So this is the P isomer. So here again, we have the same P isomer. So irrespective of whichever way you are looking at the molecule, you will always have the same configuration. Now let us look at some of the conditions for atrop isomerism. So we need a rotationally stable axis. In other words, there should be a restricted rotation about this particular single bond. And uh, the next important thing is there should be bulky substituents. In the previous case, we have seen if there are ortho substituents like bromine and other thing, the ring is uh, having a lot of strain due to which there is a very good rotationally stable axis and we can easily isolate the ortho disubstituted isomers. So in other words, presence of bulky substituents on both sides of the axis is an important condition for getting atrop isomerism. And the configurational stability of the axially chiral biaryl compounds is mainly determined by the following factors. One is the combined steric demand is the one we have seen right now and the substituents proximity to the axis. So these are all the two important things. One, there should be bulky substituent. Two, the bulky substituent should also be in the close proximity. Then only the atrop isomerism is possible because if the bulky groups are in close proximity, they will try to push the bond in such a way that we get a very nice separation. 
if the groups are very small then what we have is the less deviation from the planarity in the biphenyl systems if we have only the methyl groups then the methyl group is not bulky compared to bromine so if four methyl groups are substituted in the ortho position the deviation from the planarity will be much less compared to four bromine atoms in the ortho position that leads to very large deviation from planarity then the next one is like uh, the existence of the length because if we have carbon carbon bond carbon oxygen bond or carbon nitrogen bond then the bond length also plays a vital role if the bond length is very very long then the deviation from the planarity will be much less so this also plays another role in the case of atrope isomerism and this also helps in the rigidity of the bridge basically if the bond length is very small it is going to be very strong compared to the bond length which is very long so the next one is the atrope isomerism is basically not a physical rotation about the axis in the case of photochemical or chemical induced process there is a possibility that in many cases there is a mere physical uh, rotation but in the case of atrope isomerism it is different from the mere physical rotation and let us look at atrope isomerism in drug development we already know drug development is very crucial because uh, the enantiomers are very very crucial for the activity of a particular drug so the enantiomers formed by the bond breaking and uh, bond forming this is a very very high energy process so if we have to move from one enantiomer to another enantiomer then we have to actually break the bond whereas in the case of atrope isomerism this is a uh, restricted rotation about a single bond so in other words enantiomers are possible in the case of atrope isomers in that particular case if the rotation is very very low energy process or a moderate energy process then racemization is very much possible in the case of atrope isomerism only in the case of high energy process where we have a bulky substituents those atrope isomers are not racemized very quickly so unlike the normal enantiomers in other cases in the case of atrope isomer the single bond restricted rotation is too crucial because if it is having low energy then they racemize very quickly so when we are developing drug molecules having atrope isomerism we have to be very very careful we have to study very carefully whether it is a low energy rotation or the barrier to low energy rotation or a high energy process because these isomers will racemize very quickly if the rotation restriction is much less in other words the atrope isomers can racemize very very quickly if the rotation the single bond restricted rotation is a low energy process so this is one of the thing we have to always pay attention here we have some common scaffold that are used in the drug discovery so if the bulky groups are present on the ortho position of the biphenyl or similar structures they prevent free rotations here we have four different uh, scaffolds are uh, shown here one is a diaryl ether another one is a benzamide substituted benzamides then we have diaryl amines and hetero biaryls so these are all the different types of compounds and uh, these all compounds show atrope isomerism now we will look at uh, each case one by one so let us look at the diaryl derivative so we have a diaryl derivative here there is no substituents are present in the ortho position so this is a highly planar molecule and if you look here this is also very highly planar molecule so this molecule does not show any 
atropisomerism. In other words, we do not have any enantiomers for these two type of compounds. But if there is an orthosubject event, what happens? So for clarity, I have removed the hydrogen atoms in this kind of structure. So you don't have to worry about that. And when we have an orthosubject event, we are actually having orthosubject events here as shown here. And we also have an orthosubject event. Here again, we have an orthosubject event. So whenever we have orthosubject events, in this ring, we are having only one orthosubject event. In this ring, we have two orthosubject events. So the planar structure is completely twisted in the case of orthosubject events. So these are all the enantiomers or the atropisomers possible in this particular case. So we have to pay attention when we have orthosubject events in the diaryl ethers derivatives when we are doing drug developments. So if you look at the benzamide derivative, the normal unsubstituted benzamide is a planar one as shown here. This is again the planar one. So there is no atropisomerism in this particular case. But when we have orthosubject events, so here we have a orthosubject events as shown here. This is the isopropyl unit. There is a methyl unit shown here and we have a nitrogen having two substitute events. This is a methyl unit. This is a ethyl unit. So when we have alkyl substitutions here on the aromatic ring as well as on the nitrogen, there is a deviation from planarity. See, if you look at this molecule that is unsubstituted benzamide, this is completely planar. Whereas when we look at the substituted one, if we keep this aromatic ring in the plane, the other nitrogen and the substituents on the nitrogens are not in the same plane. They are actually deviated from the plane. So this leads to atropisomerism. So we have to be very careful in isolating the right isomers for our studies. The same can be extended to diaryl amines also. So in this particular case, instead of the amide bond, we only have the nitrogen connecting the two aromatic rings. So here also the unsubstituted one is completely planar, but the ortho substituted one, here we have a methyl group, here again we have another methyl group, and in the another ring we have one and two. So we have four substituents on the ortho position of this diaryl-amine derivative. In this case also, there is a complete deviation from the planarity. In other words, we have atropisomers shown in this particular derivative also. Then we have the benzimidazole as another derivative. Here again, see if you look at this particular moiety, this is actually perpendicular to one of the rings. So that means in this particular case, the deviation is very, very high in the case of benzimidazole derivatives. So these are completely isolable atropisomers. So we have to be very careful in using these kind of scaffolds in drug discovery. Next, let us look at uh, stereochemical reactions. Some brief introduction about uh, what are stereochemical reactions. We have two major types. One is a stereoselective one. Another one is a stereospecific one. So in the case of stereoselective one, it is actually related to product formation, in which case we have a major and a minor compounds in that particular reaction. An example is a Mukiyama aldol condensation reaction. This is an example of stereoselective reaction. Another one is stereospecific reaction. Here the product formation is basically both isomers giving different type of product. So if you start from isomer A, you get with the one set of product. And if you start from isomer B, you will get another set of product. So in those kind of reactions, we say this is a stereospecific reaction. Some examples include enzymatic reactions, SN2 reactions, E2 reactions are some of the examples of stereospecific reactions. Now, let us understand what is a stereoselective and a stereospecific reaction in terms of understanding the concept. So I am giving some example, an analogy model here. So, what is a stereoselective reaction and what is a stereospecific reaction? You go to a shop, say for example, you go to a pantaloon, 
you can get different types of clothes that is uh, women clothes are available men shirts are available jeans are available like uh, you have different types of clothes are available for the people and when you go to this shop you are actually going to purchase either for the men shirt or for the women clothes so here you are doing selective you are going to the shop and selecting from the available materials so this is what is similar to the stereo selective one that means there are multiple products are for possible in this particular reaction and one or two products are formed in major or in large excess so that is what is the selectivity so this reaction is a stereo selective reaction but on the other hand when you say stereo specific you go to a bata showroom so when you go to a bata showroom what you are going to do is basically you are going to buy shoes or footwear mainly so when you are going to a footwear the footwear may be either shoe or a chappal or something similar to that but you are going to purchase only footwear so you are going only to the bata shop so that means you are specifically going to purchase one item so that is what is called stereo specific reaction that means one starting material gives only one particular product that means you can only get footwear when you go to bata shop so that way you can make the difference between what is a stereo specific reaction and what is a stereo selective reaction in the selective case you have multiple choices and you select one amongst them in the specific reaction you want to buy some particular product you go to only one particular shop so that is how the chemical reactions also occur so in the case of stereo selective reactions there is a preferential formation of one of the stereo isomer from a pro stereogenic compound so in other words if we start from an isomer a we have two products one is a major isomer another one is a minor isomer so this is what is called stereo selective reaction so one is formed in large excess compared to another one so there is a selectivity between the product formation and when we talk about stereo specific reaction see here when two stereochemically different substrates react under similar conditions gives stereochemically or constitutionally different products in other words a is one isomer the isomer gives product c and d b is another isomer which gives a product e and f so the e and f are not formed from a the same way c and d is not formed from the b so when these two are not formed in this particular fashion we say this is a stereo specific reaction and uh, there are various types of stereo selective reactions the reactions may be based on the substrate so the substrate these are actually affected by the different reagents catalyst or the medium and the other type is called the based on the product formation so we can also have enantiomer selective or diastereo selective reactions so these are all the two major types of stereo selective reactions in this particular stereo selective reactions the reactions the products are formed from two different diastereomeric transition states so that is the reason we get two different product and one may react faster compared to the other one so we get selectively one product and this is actually controlled by various factors mainly the stereo electronic factors steric factors and other electronic factors influence the product formation so by changing the catalyst that is what we have mentioned here by changing the reagent by changing the catalyst or by changing the medium we can actually change the product distribution so this is what is the characteristics of stereo selective reactions then we have stereo specific reaction we have sn2 reaction is a stereo specific reaction in this particular case 
when we carry out this reaction, stereoisomeric starting materials gives product from one reactant that is a stereoisomer of the product from the other. In other words, if we start from R, we end up with a S isomer. So we already know SN reaction, SN2 reaction, that is the iodine is replaced by the hydroxyl group. So here the iodine is on the right hand side. In the product, the hydroxyl is on the left hand side. So the R isomer becomes S isomer. So this is a stereospecific reaction. So whenever we take one starting material exactly opposite side, that is the rear side attack, the nucleophile comes and uh, gets forms the product. So this is a very, very stereospecific reaction. Here again, there is another thing, like if we start from the S isomer, we end up with the R isomer of the hydroxy substituted one. So this stereospecific reaction always leads to inversion. But there is only one exception. When there is a neighboring group participation, there is no inversion. We always get retention. So other than that, all the SN2 reactions lead to inversion in configuration. So this is a stereospecific reaction. The next one is the E2 reactions. In this particular elimination reaction also, this starting material gives only one particular product. That is the Z product is formed in this particular case. That is uh, elimination of HBr takes place. There is a H from here and the Br from here. These two are eliminated to form the alkene. The same way in the other isomer, if we start from the other isomer, because in the first case, the bromine is pointing towards the observer. In the second case, the bromine is pointing away from the observer. So when these two different uh, starting materials are subjected to elimination reaction, we end up with the two different types of alkenes. That is, one is a Z alkene, that is a cis one, the, both the phenyl groups are on the same side. Another one is the trans or the E isomer where the phenyl groups are on the opposite side. So this way, this is again a stereospecific reaction and this reaction happens via anti-periplanar transition state. So this is what we have seen in the conformational analysis also. So anti-periplanarity is very crucial for the elimination to occur. And there are few other examples of stereospecific reactions. In this particular case, we have the addition of bromine to alkenes. This is basically a trans addition or an anti addition. So we start with the Z isomer. Bromine addition gives either 2R, 3R or the 2S, 3S isomer. That means we are getting enantiomeric products in this particular reaction. Whereas we start from the E isomer, we end up with a meso compound. So this is basically the mirror image of the other part. One half of the molecule is the mirror image of the other half. So this is what is the meso product. So the Z isomer gives a set of enantiomers, whereas the other isomer, E isomer, gives only the meso product. So this is what is called the stereospecific reaction. In other words, one starting material gives one set of products. Other starting material gives entirely different set of product. So this is what is the basic requirement or basic uh, characteristics of stereospecific reactions. If we look at uh, epoxidation, we have a different type of epoxidation. In the case of Z isomer, when we subject the Z isomer to MCPBA based uh, epoxidation, that is a cis epoxidation method, we end up with a 2S, 3R isomer. And if we subject the E isomer, we end up with a 2S, 3S isomer. So this is how we can actually say this cis addition is very stereospecific. And in the case of alkene reductions, we can also say we have two types of additions. One is a cis addition, another one is a trans or the anti addition. So here again, if these two red groups are pointing towards the observer, in the cis addition, the hydrogen is added from one side, that is from the top, let us say. And uh, these two red groups are actually pointing towards the observer remains the same. This is the cis addition. In the case of trans addition, we have one of the red group pointing towards us. Another one is little bit on the plane. 
So this hydrogen atom and the other hydrogen atom, if you look, this is pointing towards the observer and this is pointing away from the observer. So this is what is called the trans addition. So or the anti addition. So this reaction again is a stereo specific reaction. The starting material is the same, but it gives two different types of cis and trans addition leads to different type of products. Here is the summary of various stereo specific reactions. The addition of HX that is uh, hydrohalogenation to alkenes produces anti addition. So basically this is on the case of alkenes we are talking about. So all these reactions refer to alkenes. And addition of HOH that is hydration can be either syn or anti addition. And in majority of cases, it is a syn addition. And uh, it is a hydrogenation case. If it is a metal based one, this is a syn addition. And addition of halogens, that can be basically anti addition, that is, a halonium ion formation is involved. So that leads to anti addition. And in the case of XOH, that is the halohydration, it can be anti if we are using an epoxide opening or halonium ion opening, both are anti addition. And in the case of dihydroxylation, especially if you use osmium tetroxide, that is a syn addition. And if you use epoxide opening, it can also be an anti addition, but all these reactions are stereo specific. And if you simply do the epoxidation of an alkene, it is basically syn addition, depending on what catalyst we are using. Then we have SN2 reaction, which is an inversion in stereochemistry. The same way elimination is an anti addition. So these are all the other examples of stereo specific reactions. And some examples of stereo selective reactions. The stereo selective reaction is a reaction in which one of the stereo isomer is formed in excess over the other isomer. There are two major types one is a enantio selective reaction or a diastereo selective reaction. The stereo selectivity is basically dominated by the structural features that is the steric and the electronic feature of the reactants, reagents or reaction conditions. So by changing the steric and the electronic features, we can actually modify or manipulate the stereo selective reactions. There is an example here shown is a diastereo selective reaction in this particular case this particular double bond, the alkene double bond is reduced using metal hydrogens. So we get two types of uh, diastereomers. One is a cis isomer, this is formed in 68% and another one is a trans isomer that is formed in 32%. So the reduction of this compound is basically called as a stereo selective reaction because out of the both the products, one is formed in large excess compared to the other one. So this is what is an example of stereo selective reaction. Here we are getting diastereomers. So this reaction is a diastereo selective reaction. Let us compare the stereo selective and the stereo specific reaction. In the case of stereo selective reaction, this is basically the reactant selective reaction. And when we say stereo specific reaction, it is a product selective reaction. That means one starting material gives one particular product. Whereas in the case of stereo selective reaction, depending on the transition state which is involved in the reactant, the product distribution changes. So in the case of stereo selective reaction, different conditions on the same substrate may lead to different major and minor products. Whereas in the case of stereo specific reaction, the same reactant leads to the same product. That means one isomer gives one set of isomer, other uh, starting material gives a different set of isomers. So here the same reactant gives the same product. Whereas in the case of stereo selective, by changing the condition, we can actually change the distribution. And uh, when a non stereo isomer giving a stereo isomer in the predominant form or an exclusive product, if you are starting from a non stereo isomer and we are ending up with a particular stereo isomer then we generally get selectively one of the isomer 
In the case of stereospecific reaction, the stereoisomer which gives another stereoisomer in predominant form. That means one isomer exclusively gives one isomer. That is how the relationship exists in the case of stereospecific reaction. And uh, we, it may happen that different stereoisomers will react differently in the case of stereospecific reactions. So here is an example of a stereo selective or stereo specific reaction. If you look at this particular case, we have a cis isomer formed in 70 to 85% and the trans isomer formed in 30 to 35%. So there is a selectivity between the product formation. So this reaction is basically a stereo selective reaction. And if you look at this particular case, here we are getting only 90% of one single isomer. So this particular reaction is an example of stereospecific reaction. We can also say it is stereoselective, but it is more importantly, it is a stereospecific reaction. And when we look at this particular reduction, here we have a cis isomer that is formed in 25% and a trans isomer formed in 75%. So this is again an example of stereoselective reaction. So if you look at uh, these two reactions, the starting materials uh, position of the double bond is changed. So, but the reagent and the catalyst used are one and the same. So when we are having different types of starting materials, so these two products, the product obtained have different uh, ratio. In the first case, the cis isomer is formed in large excess. In the second case, the trans isomer is formed in large case. So as I mentioned, in the case of stereoselective reactions, by changing the substrate, the starting material, it is possible for us to change the product distribution. So this is what is the important thing about stereoselective reactions. Let us look at few more examples. So this particular reaction, the conversion of bromine to the hydroxyl case. So this you already know is uh, very similar to SN2 type reactions. So in this particular case, we are actually getting 50-50 ratio of this product. So this is a non-stereo selective reaction in this particular case. And we have another reaction. We have an alkene. The alkene is converted into the dihydroxylated product. We are getting a 97% enantiomeric excess. That means one product is formed in large excess over the other one. So this is a stereo specific reaction because one starting material gives only one type of product. So this is a stereo select specific reaction. In summary, let us recap what we have studied so far. We have studied about atrope isomerism. What is the basic definition of atrope isomerism and how to assign atrope isomerism? We have taken binol example and a few other examples. And we have also studied about how atrope isomerism is important in the drug development. Later on, we studied about stereochemical reactions, the definitions of stereoselective reaction and the stereospecific reactions and the examples of stereoselective and stereospecific reactions. With this, we conclude this session. Thank you.